Hello, 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 nurses. This is Mrs. Ignacio. I am here to discuss chapter four with you, the nursing process, critical thinking, and clinical judgment. These are the foundations of what nursing is all about because we are not robots. We have to think and analyze information and then be able to make decisions that are evidence-based and safe and effective for our patients. So let's jump right in. Okay, we're going to jump right in. So again, at the beginning of each chapter, you should be looking at the objectives. What do I need to learn or glean from this particular chapter? And so in chapter four, we're going to be learning about the nursing process. You should remember that the nursing process is ADPI, assessment, diagnosis, planning, intervention or implementation, and then evaluation. And we're going to talk about that throughout chapters four, five, and six. Uh, we'll identify the components of the nursing process. Again, that is ADPI. We're going to compare and contrast the terms critical thinking clinical reasoning and clinical judgment because i know you hear that those uh, phrases all the time what does it really mean okay so we'll break that down we'll unpack that identify the steps of the problem solving process and we're going to list the steps used in making decisions we're also going to identify how we can improve our critical reasoning skills we're going to apply critical thinking process to a real life problem. And this is something that you all do every single day. We're going to also talk about the use of critical thinking in nursing. And in clinical, when you get to your clinical setting, you're going to always, always, always use the nursing process. You're going to think in a scientific, systematic way. Maybe making a checklist is going to be best for you, but you're going to develop a, an, you know, a procedure, something that is going to be effective for you because everybody's brain is wired differently. Okay, uh, so you're also going to uh, use tools to identify patients' problems. A lot of times there's screening tools that you can use in the clinical setting like sepsis screening, Braden uh, scale should be measuring their skin integrity. We have different tools to measure different things about our patients based on their diagnosis. So what is the nursing process? Well, again, ADPI is the acronym that you should think of when we think of the nursing process. And so this is a way that we care for patients. It's a way that we uh, collaborate with other healthcare professionals, members of the team, to achieve the best outcome for our patient. So the assessment. The assessment is when we obtain information from the patient. Maybe the patient says it burns when I pee or I have an itchy rash on my knee. These kinds of things are known as subjective data. Objective data is what we observe as a healthcare professional. That could be from a physical examination, from vital signs, from an x-ray, from blood work, but it's something that we observe that is objective data. So when we think about the nursing diagnosis, we are thinking about a problem statement based on the patient's medical diagnosis. If the patient has asthma, and that's the medical diagnosis, the nursing diagnosis could be ineffective airway exchange. If the patient has pressure ulcers, we can uh, nursing diagnosis we can use is impaired skin integrity. So the nursing diagnosis really focuses the nurse on what he or she is going to do to care for the patient. When we plan, we are getting resources together. It could be teaching, it could be medication, it could be treatments for wounds, we are getting all of our materials together and we are planning how are we going to approach the patient and their family if the pam if the family is in charge or <coughs> excuse me involved in their care 
implementation, we're actually now going to do it. We gathered all the information to teach our patients on how to successfully administer their meter dose inhaler, right, using a spacer. So now we're going to actually go in and administer the medication, teach the patient about their triggers, teach the patient about, okay, at home you need to get up and walk so you decrease your risk for pressure ulcers. And then we're going to evaluate, right? So after we administer that albuterol, we need to go back and reassess the patient. Let me auscultate, listen to their lung sounds. Are their lung sounds clear? That's going to be really important. We always want to evaluate because guess what? If our intervention or if what we implemented was not successful, we're going to have to do something else to help care for the patient. We're going to assess the skin, right? Re reassess the skin. Okay, the patient, uh, their pressure ulcer is actually getting better, right? Or maybe it's not getting better, but whatever we find, we're going to make a determination on how we can best treat the patient. So those are kind of examples uh, applied to the nursing process. And again, never lose this nursing process. This is how nurses think continually. At clinical, you'll never hear the nurse say, Hmm, let me use the nursing process to work with my patient. This is something that just happens automatically. Okay, so let's take a look at the assessment. Again, we're collecting, organizing data, and we're looking at the information that the patient tells us. The family member may tell us information. We're looking at the health history and physical. We're looking at other tests. Maybe the patient has seen specialists like a gastroenterologist. Maybe they've seen a urologist. Maybe they've seen a nutritionist, but we're going to look at everybody that has something to say, everybody that's a part of the team, on what they're uh, saying about this patient's condition. And here's a slide on the nursing diagnosis. So again, we're sorting the analyzing, the assessment data to identify potential health problems. So we're looking ahead. So that tells me as a nurse, you can't be just, you know, kind of la laissez-faire. You just can't be lean back. You need to be forward leaning. You need to be proactive and looking out for complications, things that could go wrong with your patient. You really need to be on heightened alert looking at things that will um, have implications for your patient's health status. So you just can't be lazy. You can't just be laid back. You have to be forward leaning, uh, aggressive, not to the point of being obnoxious, but really proactive. Okay. And so we are going to prioritize what's going to be the most important for my patient. And we're always going to use Maslow's hierarchy. Remember, pink scars belong everywhere, so accessorize. We're going to be looking at, okay, I'm going to take care of those basic needs, physiological needs. I'm going to take care of food, clothing, shelter, airway, breathing, circulation, ABCs. I'm going to make sure that that is a priority. Then I can meet my patient's other needs. When we plan, again, these are steps that we are actually going to take, gathering materials, gathering medications. We are thinking about goals. Remember, goals should be specific specific, uh, and I'm thinking SMART goals. When I say SMART goals, they're specific, they're measurable, they're attainable, they are realistic, and they have a specific time frame. That is how we have goals for our patient. You always want to have at least one short-term goal. Within this shift, the patient will have their pain managed. The pain will become uh, decreased from 7 out of 10 to a 3 out of 10. That's a short-term goal during this shift, a long-term goal, two to three months. Within two to three months, the patient will be able to ambulate independently using their assisted device. You want your goals, again, to be SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic for that patient and time frame. Okay, and when I say realistic, here's an example. Okay, uh, I am five, three and a half. So if I, and I'm 50 years old. So if I said, um, you know, in the next five years, I'm going to be in the WNBA, you better tell me, Mrs. Ignacio, that is not a realistic goal. Okay, because that you're way past the age and your height is not on your side. Okay, and when we think about implementation, we are now going to carry out these interventions as we prioritize. 
prioritize them. And if you have difficulty with prioritizing, you're going to take care of the thing that can kill the patient the fastest. That's going to be the thing that you need to do first, okay? A lot of times we have many things to do for our patients, and we have to, especially for test questions, we have to prioritize. What do we need to do first? Okay, and that's how you also answer your test questions. Now, some interventions can be delegated by other members of the team, like vital signs can be delegated uh, to the unlicensed assisted personnel. However, if that patient's condition is unstable, meaning that their vital signs are up and down, meaning their blood pressure is up and down, it could be elevated, it could be dropping, that is not a patient that it will be actually delegated to um, an unlicensed assisted person or an LPN, that patient will have to be cared for by the registered nurse because LPNs cannot have patients that are unstable. Now, in real life, you're going to see a whole bunch of things, but again, we're in living in the NCLEX world, so we're going by those NCLEX standards, okay? The next piece of the nursing process is evaluation. How did the patient respond to anything that I did, those interventions? We're going to to look and say, did the patient meet the goals? Did they meet those short-term goals? Did they meet the long-term goals? And we are going to figure out, okay, based on this, what's the plan for the patient? Do we have to do uh, something else or is the patient good to go, right? What has to change or should we continue and just monitor the patient, right? So that is your E in ADPI, that's the evaluation. All right, let's jump now into critical thinking. So critical thinking is going to be essential. So we have to use the nursing process if we're critically thinking. We are going to use careful judgment. We are going to think things through. We're not going to be haphazard. We're not going to be half butt cheeked, right? We are going to be pers purposeful. We're going to evaluate what our plans are, how would it affect the patient, and would our actions, would these plans give us the outcome or the goal that we want for this patient? And so if it's not going to give you the goal, then don't do it. It's not safe for the patient, okay? Critical thinking. So first things first. When we are applying critical thinking, <coughs> excuse me, and caring for our patient, what is the problem? What are we trying to help the patient with? Okay, is it ineffective airway clearance? Is it impaired skin integrity? Is it a circulatory issue? What is the problem? Okay, and that's where your nursing diagnosis comes in. The next thing, once you de clearly define the problem that you're going to work with the patient on, well, what are all the possible alternative solutions? Well, if the patient has impaired skin integrity, I've got to look at turning, repositioning the patient, maybe a protective barrier, getting the patient up, moving them off those bony prominences, okay? Is their nutrition adequate for them to be able to keep healthy skin, right? Uh, is their skin dry and intact or is their skin moist? So I have to look at all of these different things that I could do uh, with this patient that may have a skin integrity issue. And I have to think, if I turn and reposition the patient every two hours, that is the standard. If you see a test question that says turn the patient through every three hours, that's not the right answer. It's two hours, okay? What if I turn the patient every two hours? What's going to happen? Well, good things will happen. What if I keep the patient's skin clean, dry, and intact? Good things will happen, right? So every possible intervention, everything that you can do, is this a good thing? What would happen if I keep the patient wet, if they have urinary incontinence? Well, bad things will happen, right? Their skin will break down. They can have an infection. They can get a UTI, right? So you have to think this through. And then you want to predict, predict the likelihood of the outcome, okay? If I was to keep the patient clean, dry, uh, and uh, have their skin intact, would this be a good outcome? 
Well, yes, it would. And you want to choose the path of action or the course of action that's going to have the best outcome for the patient and minimize undesirable outcomes. So in order for you to develop your critical thinking, and some of you might not like this, you have to read. OK, there is no way around it. OK, I've had some students tell me in the past that they don't like to read. That is not a recipe for success. That, that's the bottom line. Effective writing, you have to be able to commun communicate effectively, not just orally, but written communication. So when I do things like on Dean's Corner and say, use this professional email signature, there's a reason why that is a part of being a professional nurse. Effective writing is essential. You're going to be writing nurses notes. You're going to be documenting these, you know, the things you do for the patient, because if you don't document it, it didn't exist. If your writing is not professional in a court of law, they can pull this, your nurses notes up and say, look, this is an incompetent nurse. Her communication is incoherent. She has or he has misspelled words. We don't know what they're saying. They're not using proper medical terminology. And this will be held against you. OK, so effective writing is key. Attentive listening. You have to actively listen. If a patient is telling you something, face them, look them in the eye. You shouldn't be on your cell phone, right? You're looking at your patient in the eye. You're not looking at the clock like, okay, when is this patient going to get out of here? My shift is almost over. You have to have good body language, an open posture, your arms should not be crossed, like, okay, you know, that's a closed posture, that sends a message that you're really not connecting with your patient, you want to actively listen, look them in the eye, nod your head, say, mm-hmm, okay, tell me more, you want to continue to do those kinds of things to keep that line of communication going, have a great relationship or establish a rapport with your patient okay so critical thinking that all these are all things that go with critical thinking so it also requires skills that's why you have lab right and so that's why your lab instructor mrs holland is taking things step by step so you have these appropriate skills some of you may have a lot of experience some of you may have zero experience so sometimes in lab if things are going a little slow, we have to start at ground zero. We have to break it down ABC style, Sesame Street, Sesame Street style, because we want to make sure that everybody gets the skills that they need. Now, also experience. Some of you may have a lot of experience. Some of you may have no experience. But the more experience you get, the more your critical thinking is going to develop and the more effective your critical thinking is going to be. Also, what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. So if you go into clinical with a negative attitude, like, oh, man, we're just here. I got to do 12 hours. No, I'm going to use this 12 hours to invest in my practice of nursing. I'm going to learn as much as I can. I'm going to be a fly on the wall. Even if the nurse doesn't want me there, I'm going to listen. I'm going to observe and I'm going to soak up as much as I can. Critical thinking, uh, besides skills and experience and knowledge, right, that we get from, from reading and interacting, we also have to understand that we are governed by a professional standard and a code of ethics, and that is dictated by the American Nurses Association. So critical thinking, always use the nursing process. That is your assessment, right, getting information in an organized fashion, your nursing diagnosis, right, getting that, uh, you know, prioritized nursing diagnosis based on what the medical diagnosis is. Remember, the medical diagnosis is separate from the nursing diagnosis, okay? We are also going to plan, plan things and set goals for our patients, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time-constrained goals, short-term and long-term. We're going to implement these items for our patient, we're going to perform interventions. We're going to physically do something. It could be teaching. 
administering medication, but we're going to do something. And then we're going to evaluate what I did for the patient. Did it work out well? What was the outcome? Okay. So here's a question. Which of the following is an example of a nurse's statement that reflects using the scientific method in the nursing process? I believe that this patient is getting depressed. The patient doesn't look right to me. I think something is wrong. The patient's husband told me that she is feeling very uncomfortable. Okay, um, the patient reports more pain than yesterday and her blood pressure is elevated. Okay, so take some time to think about, okay, what the answer for this question could possibly be. And again, the scientific method. So if you're thinking answer number four, you are correct, because this is telling me that the pay, I'm paying attention to the patient. The patient is reporting more pain. And even I would like it to say the patient's pain on a pain rating scale. So yesterday the pain was two out of 10. Today the pain is six out of 10. So even more specific than that. Okay, and the blood pressure is elevated. Well, I want the numbers. I want the value. But out of these four answers, number four is the best choice because it's showing the use of the scientific method. It's showing the nursing process and it's showing critical thinking. Okay, so the next section of this lesson is going to be talking about, okay, principles of setting priorities. How do we know what to do first for a patient? Um, how do we understand these factors? What should we consider? And in clinical practice, you're actually going to prioritize care. You're going to be doing some nursing diagnosis, and your clinical instructor is going to expect you to have that information prioritized. So when we think about prioritization, or we say, hey, what's the priority? High priority is placed on life-threatening issues like airway, okay? If the patient doesn't have an airway, that is a high priority kind of issue. If the patient can't breathe, high priority. If the patient doesn't have adequate circulation, that's a high priority, okay? Because if we don't address these issues, the high priority issues, the patient will not survive. Okay, medium priority, problems that threaten health or coping ability. Okay, so this could be like a patient that has uh, elevated blood pressure, a patient that has elevated, elevated blood sugar, right? We need to address those issues, right? After those high priority issues are addressed. Now, low priority, things that won't really affect the patient, okay, if they're not attended to that day or that week, okay? So when we think about things that are low priority, if the patient says, I have a hangnail, okay, great. I understand that you have a hangnail, but we've got a patient in the next room that is going into cardiac arrest, okay? So I'm going to have to, um, you know, work with another patient, but I'll be back to check on you, right? And you don't want to tell the patient, now don't get me wrong, don't say that their hangnail is not important because that is really, you know, important because of course we're concerned about skin integrity. But again, when we think about the priority, which patient would we see first? I'm going to see that high priority, a life-threatening kind of scenario first, okay? And so when we organize our workload, we are going to change our priority based on the patient's condition. Now, that patient that coded, they're probably going to be taken off the unit, uh, gone to ICU, right? But when they come back, they're going to be stable. And that might not be the patient that we necessarily have to see first, because if your patient uh, is unstable, that's going to be a patient that we need to see first. If the patient has high acuity, like they're really, really sick, they can have an infection, uh, they can have a respiratory infection, they can uh, have blood sugar issues, uh, they may have you know, a wound, they may have a lot of different things going on. That's going to be the patient. The sickest patient is going to be the one that we see first. Okay, so when you're organizing your workload, 
excuse me, you want to think about who's the sickest patient and what are the things that are the most important that I have to do for this patient. Now, you also have to be flexible because sometimes this actually changes based on the patient's condition because you can have a patient that is doing great and all of a sudden, boom, they start you know, deteriorating. Their blood pressure starts dropping. They may end up having a stroke. Like You need to be able to be flexible and, and not say, well, I was going to see you third, um, so I can't see you right now. No, this patient needs you right now. So you have to be uh, very flexible, okay, and know when to ask for help. Don't be ashamed or embarrassed or afraid to ask for help, okay? And every two hours, you should reassess your plan. Is it working for you, how you organize your workload? So because the goal is you, you don't want your planning, your prioritization, your decision making, you don't want it to hurt your patient, okay? So you have to, you know, think these things through and, you know, get help if you need it. You're going to use this critical thinking <laughs> so you can help your patients. That is why we want you to operate in critical thinking mode. I just don't want you to be a robot and just pushing pills to your patient. No, I want you to think and have a questioning attitude. Ask questions and also try to have solutions when you're asking questions. Uh, have options, right? So here's question number two. Which of the following nursing actions is the best example of problem solving? So requesting the IV team to start an antibiotic drip on a patient with a history of being a difficult stick, offering to call the kitchen to provide an alternative breakfast for a patient who does not like cooked cereal, trying several different difficult wound dressings to determine which one the patient can apply the most effectively, calling for another paid medication order when the current drug results in the patient uh, experiencing nausea. Okay, so what is out of all of these the best example of problem solving? Okay, what is asking me <laughs> to think maybe outside of the box, to think things through, to get a good course of action for my patient for a potentially complex problem? Okay, okay, so if you said Number four, calling for another pain medication order when the current drug results in the patient uh, experiencing na nausea. Well, yes, if, and what does that mean? If the pain medication that the patient is uh, taking, actually, is that correct? Hold on, let me make sure that I'm reading the right um, one. Um. Okay, no, that was not correct. I was like, wait a minute, that's not right. Um, so I take that back. It's not four because that's that's uh, something that I would expect you to do. Um, so when we think about problem solving, it's trying to determine, okay, what's the best solution? And you have to try all the different things that could happen. So three is going to be the best answer. That's why I was like, wait a minute, that's not right. So three is going to be the best answer because the nurse is gathering information, <coughs> excuse me, trying several different products and then determines what's going to be best for the patient. So when we think about problem solving, we look at the alternatives, all of the alternatives, okay? And, you know, requesting the IV team to, to help that patient, that's not really critical thinking. That's just like, okay, I'm going to call the IV team. And that's also an understanding if the patient is a difficult stick, that's the, pr the procedure. You're going to call the IV team. Okay. Number two, if the the patient, um, you know, doesn't like what was, you know, submitted for breakfast, or if they have an issue, the expectation is, 
that you're going to call the kitchen to get something else. Um, if the patient is responding natively to a medication, it's the expectation that, okay, you're going to let the doctor know so they can get something else. Like that is, you know, doesn't take a lot of critical thinking, right? But what does take critical thinking, right? Trying different things is three, trying several different wound dressings to determine which one the patient can apply the most effective. Effectively. So this is kind of like your trial and error and figuring out what's going to be best. And that's what your critical thinking, clinical judgment is all about. Trying different things and thinking things through and seeing what's best for the patient to implement what's best for the patient. All right, that concludes the lecture on chapter four. And remember, always, always, always think like a nurse.